Well, hello everyone and welcome to another episode of the New Ground Life and Leadership Podcast. Uh, today I'm excited to be joined by my good friend Martin Cooper, who is Principal Lecturer of Songwriting and Head of Music Theory. <laughs> Tidy up the introduction later. Uh, at the British and Irish Modern Music Institute. I can't say the word Irish without going Irish. British and Irish Modern Music Institute. Also an elder at King's Church Eastbourne, part of New Ground Churches. Uh, where he's led worship for many years as well. Many uh, years, hello. Many years, many years, not too many. You know. <laughs> many. <laughs> Martin, great to have you with us. Thanks, hello. Hi. So, Martin, um, we had a conversation a couple of years ago now. We did. In a minibus on the way back from a conference, and um, you just kind of spun my mind a bit with some of your music theory stuff. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Since then, I thought, ah, I really want to get some of that stuff recorded and share with people because um, I think it would help not just Christians in general, but worship leaders in particular, songwriters in our churches in particular. Yeah. Um, why don't we start, though, with just uh, how did you get into be- being the principal lecturer of songwriting and head of music <laughs> theory at Brighton and an Irish Modern <laughs> Institute? <laughs> how, did you, how did you get into the music industry and uh, when did it become such a, a big interest of yours? Okay, music industry. So I did my degree in English, English literature, language and literature, um, with, and I graduated in 1996. Um, I then studied music for a year after that because I was always interested in music. I, I'd been playing music for a while at that point. I decided while I was studying music after my degree um, that I wanted to try and get into working music. So... I knew people from church that worked for Kingsway and ICC as they were then, you know, kind of Eastbourne being a big hub hub of um, the Christian music industry back in the 90s and early 2000s. Um, and I knew people that could help me get into the Christian music scene as far as working goes, which I did basically. So I, I did a lot in the Christian music scene Um from 1998 until about 2005 Um, and then 2006 I started working at BIM in Brighton so I live in Eastbourne travel across to Brighton to do lectures uh, at BIM Um, so my kind of I don't want to use the word career in Christian music because I don't like using that word but I just have on the podcast Um, that sort of segued into Working at BIM in 2006. Well, even, you know, your your kind of nervousness of using that word career exposes part of the challenge that we might perhaps going to talk about is, and it's a challenge for anyone in ministry. Yep. When you get paid to do something, it inevitably becomes a career, or it can do. Yeah. But it's also a a passion, a calling, something that's close to your heart. And so any Christian worker has to navigate that tension. But um, why, why, why music? Why worship? How did that, why was that such a, a passion of yours? When did that become... Uh, big interest. Yeah. Um, so I started being interested in music. Actually, the first two of the early things I remember in my life mm-hmm. were the day that John Lennon died, um, 1980, I think it was. So I, I was a young kid then. And I remember my dad coming upstairs to say to my mum, terrible news, John Lennon's just died. And I'd never heard of John Lennon. And I remember at the time thinking, I've never heard my mum and dad talk about this John Lennon guy that they obviously know because they're both devastated that he's died. And then I found out who he was and who the Beatles were. And I remembered um, for about the next two weeks, Beatles films were just shown back to back on BBC. So after school, I'd get in from school and we'd watch a Beatles film and listen. Your mum and dad would listen to Beatles music. And it struck me even at an early age then that how important music is to people because the whole world seemed to stop at that point when John Lennon died, and I had no idea who he was. And then just a few years later, um, when Live Aid happened in 1985, again, you know, the entire world seemed to stop and take note of what was happening in Ethiopia at the time, and the famines, and, and pull together with music. So it, even as a kid, I was kind of just subconsciously struck by music seems to be something that everybody can find important and everybody can find inclusivity in and everybody can come together and and help not that I thought that as a eight-year-old but you know I guess subconsciously that seeped in then and it was always something that I found fascinating um the reason I got decided to pursue it was that during my English degree 
My dad died fairly suddenly or fairly quickly. And at the time I was going to do and finish my English degree and then probably go and do a postgrad law course and be a lawyer. Uh, that was my kind of plan A at the time. And then when my dad died, I took stock of life. I'd only been a Christian about a year at this point um, in 1994 when my dad died. Um, I took stock of everything then and thought, you know what? I like music. It's been a tough time. I was finding being a young Christian with my dad, just I'm the, I'm the only Christian in my, or I was the only Christian in my family. So, you know, it wasn't like we had faith to share amongst us with my mum and my brother and so on. So I was, you know, it was a tough time when my dad died. Um, and I thought, I, I just, I like music. I'm just going to go and do music for a while and see what happens. Mm. So I did that at the end of my degree and it just turned into something that carried on really in various forms. Mm. And so did you find in music help, helped you to process some of your grief as well? <sighs> That's a good question. Yeah. I, I thinking back, yes, it did. I mean, you know, I, I'm an introvert by nature and I process things, you know, that's how I, you know, I reflect on things and work them out. So yeah, I, I can remember actually specific times of listening to specific songs and, mm -hmm. you know, struggling my way through things by listening, almost deliberately listening to specific songs to kind of process grief and try and move through out to the other side of it. And, um, and some challenges as well. You know, I said, I was, a, I was a young Christian, mm -hmm just beginning to get into what the Christian life is and knowing God and relationship in God and, and, and some challenges as well of kind of, you know, singing truth about God and thinking I've only just really begun to understand this and now I've got to process this thing at the same time. And, mm. you know, and I think one of the things that I was thinking about this morning before you, before you came around that back then, I think one of the things that really helped back then, which would have been mid nineties, so much of the theology or truth that I took on board, you know, let kind of seep into my my life um, came from songs, came from worship songs. So I think, you know, long before I knew the lyrics of a lot of the songs we were singing were from the Psalms or from Galatians or from Ephesians. I, I didn't at that time know that we were singing deep truths from Galatians. I just knew it's a song. Mm. But I think looking back now, part of processing that time of grief was typically in those days, the songs which we used to sing were so heavily centered on deep truth, you know, straight from the Bible, that a lot of my theology came from songs before it came from the Bible, which was a good thing. And I think, sort of thinking this morning, that in a lot of ways, that sort of thing seems to have of disappeared to a large extent and now we sing more about emotional responses and sort of singing around our lives congregationally rather than so much you know today we're singing this and we're singing this and we're singing this and so much truth got into me mm -hmm. as a young Christian straight from the bible from songs mm -hmm. I think that's maybe something we've and then, uh, no, away from. no doubt come on talk more about the responsibility then of songwriters in the songs that we write and actually the responsibility of elders and leaders in churches not abdicate that responsibility of you know just let them choose the songs we'll come back to that because i think there's you know it's an inevitably a, a place that this conversation will go but i i'm also just really interested in you know john lennon the awakening of realizing through the death of John Lennon and, and Live Aid how significant music is in bringing people together, and then as a Christian discovering that music is a is a form of uh, discipleship. It's a way that we, uh, we we find it's the language of our hearts a lot of the time helps us to process our emotional life and engage with God. So I, that I find just really quite fascinating mm. about what it means to be a human being. And as someone who teaches on this, uh, why is that? Like, <laughs> where does that come from? Um, why is music so? So important to human cultures. Let's start with that one. <laughs> well, that's a small question. Yeah, Let's just rattle through that one. <laughs> Why is it so important to human cultures? Um, uh, well, I human mean, beings, right, right. Human We're beings. Cultures are a reflection of the beings. <laughs> yeah, okay. I mean, at various times in history, 
songs were how people learn. <laughs> you know, that's how you learn. If you if you don't read and don't write, and there's no internet and there's no printed press and so on, how do you actually tell people what's happening in the world? Well, a lot of the kind of long, you know. <sighs> war folk songs and so on were just well this is what's happening in the world and this is how we pass it along to each other and teach children what's happening in the world so and doing that in song you know is a way to to remember it i mean for you and i and everybody you know the first things we learn when we're kids is kind of rhythmic patterns and nursery rhymes and we can still remember all those things now because that's how you remember and how you learn so i think there's just a inbuilt reception, I think, in people of just learning patterns and learning rhythms and learning melodies and you never forget them once you've learnt them. Um, and a lot of pop songwriting, for want of a better word, whether it's the Beatles or whoever or whoever, you know, or Chris Tomlin um, and Hillsong and that kind of thing, a lot of it is just or at its best, I think it's deep biblical truth set in a way that everybody can sing it and everybody can take it on board and everybody can, you know, mm. worship. Do you have any like, th 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 theories about, again, why it is that we're made like that? Why, why is it that rhythm and rhyme and repetition or whatever, why is it that's more memorable to us um, than straightforward lessons? Yeah. I think, so, there's been studies that show that, you know, there's studies that show what is the kind of optimal tempo of a song. How fast or slow do people like songs, you know? And round about 120 beats a minute has been shown, you know, in studies, in scientific studies. That's just a sweet spot of people at large like that as a tempo partly because it makes us feel good. So for I think that there was a trend for five years in a row where the average speed, average tempo of songs on Spotify was round about 95 beats a minute for five years in a row. So music was getting slower and sadder, basically, and people wanted slower and sadder music. At the end of each year, the average tempo of songs on Spotify was 95 beats a minute. And then... Suddenly, last year, the average tempo of songs on Spotify was 122 beats a minute because during the pandemic, people didn't want to feel sad anymore. They didn't choose to listen to somber, melancholy songs. If you're stuck at home in lockdown, as we all were, then you want to feel better. And suddenly everybody gravitated. You know, nobody said, I'm going to listen to a faster song. I'm going to listen to 120 beats a minute, 120 beats a minute. But we all went... I just need to feel better today than I did, you know, when I woke up. And that's a tempo that we as humans gravitate towards because it makes us feel better. Mm. Partly because, um, again, the studies have kind of shown that there's an innate clock inside us. We all live our lives to 60 seconds in a minute and 60 minutes an hour and 24 hours in a day and so on. And... 120 beats a minute is obviously two beats per second and so on. So there's just this kind of inbuilt sense of rhythm, a, a metronome inside us that we just move to that tempo and we walk to that tempo as well. So the average walking pace kind of slots in with the rhythm of a clock and the rhythm of a metronome and how fast we want to move naturally and how fast we do move naturally. So there is just this kind of way we're built that just works at some tempos and makes us feel happy at some tempos and deliberately makes us reflective at some tempos and so on and so forth. So um, I don't know if that, does that answer yeah, your question? No, or am I just rambling no, about no, no, time? Yeah, time. <laughs> time. I mean, it's come on, the theory of time. Okay. I, would, I would love to talk about that. I've been studying that recently. <laughs> well, you can cut case, that bit out. In that case, go for it. 
for it. Tell us, tell us some theories about time. I oh, know, but we'll, I won't go down that rabbit hole. Actually, we'll we'll cut this bit out. <laughs> yeah, because I mean, you you notice it, don't you? Your your mood does re- your your mood is reflected in your pace. Yeah. If, if you're reflective or sad, you go slow. If you're yeah. excited, you go fast. And it's and, it, and it's not always the case that if you are excited, you go fast. It's if you go fast, you get excited. Yeah. If you go slow, you get reflective. Yeah. And I know we, we've talked to Krista Friend on here as a psychiatrist, and she talks about the engaging the parasympathetic system. That just things that we do, our body, the way we yeah. move our body changes our mood. So I know we, that idea isn't too new to us, but it's the um, you know, as, as we've said, we've had a conversation before where you, you pointed out. The, our very first experience of the world is of music in the womb. We hear, you know, internal sounds from our mothers, yeah. and no, most noticeably the heartbeat. What's so? Are you? Are you? Is the average heartbeat one hundred and twenty? What's the heartbeats per minute as well? What? No, that's, that sounds a bit fast. That's a bit fast. <laughs> <laughs> um, it's um, I, I can't remember off the top no. of my head, but I know I know that in in clubs, for example. So if a DJ has got a a music set on throughout an evening in a club, it will pretty much start at, for example, 80 beats a minute. And by the end of the evening, the tempo of the music is 137, I think, pretty much in clubs, Um, which basically goes with the heart pace, heartbeat pace of people in the clubs. So you start here at somewhere around 80 beats a minute, and you end here at somewhere around 137 beats a minute. So the music begins at 80 beats a minute, where your heart is naturally just pacing itself. Mm-hmm. And you end more energetically at the end of the night on 137 beats a minute, where the heart is naturally following suit or vice versa. So there, there is definitely a, a link between tempo and heart rate, a kind of, you know, the way they marry each other. Um, I know my resting heart rate from my watch that tells me is is generally round about 60 beats a minute, 62 mm. beats a minute. So mm. if I'm static or if I'm just living my normal day, my heart pretty much beats round about one beat a second. And obviously that's part of what gets in into my brain. And music at 120 beats a minute is double my resting heart rate and so on. So I think there is definitely a link between just literally, like you said, how we're formed and how we then perceive and receive music. And actually, I think the the link, going back to your earlier comment about how human cultures um, transferred information, stories and lessons through song and the way that we're built as human beings, as musical creatures, that points to the kind of the double dynamic that goes on in music that you can manipulate or motivate, depending on your motives, um, you can manipulate just through the pace of the music, but then also through the content of the songs, yeah. can't you? And and that's what so that's where my mind starts to go when I hear you talk about this. Is that we are the music that we listen to, the content of the the stories in our music that we listen to, like you talked about as an early Christian, the, the themes of the songs shape you. And I think particularly when you're a new Christian, the, the formative years do seem to be pretty formative. And, and once they're set, they're set. Mm. You learn your theology in the first few years of your christian life a lot of the time it doesn't get easily get unpicked um for good or for bad and so i guess you know what so we talk about um talk about how to make songs catchy or or how to manipulate mood through the the beat of the music but i know you've also spoken to me before about the kind of content not just the content of the lyrics but the the noises that we make and the attractiveness or the the stickability of the sound that people make just um, remind me again some of the 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 things you've shared before about pop music yeah. and um, where and why some of our songs are more popular than others. Yeah. So one of the um, one of the songs that I use as an example in, in songwriting lectures is um, th- the first track from The Greatest Showman soundtrack from a few years back now, uh, The Greatest Show, and kind of do this little study in the lesson on, on the first five seconds of that song because, yeah, I mean, that I think that's still the... Biggest selling album of the 21st century, the Great Showman soundtrack. It's either that or Adele, but you know it's right up there as everybody's heard it and everybody likes it. And I'm always fascinated by you know why why does everybody like this song and not everybody at all likes this song and they're not that different 
so what are the differences between the one that we all like and the one that is more of a niche song if they're similar and i remember watching the greatest showman with my kids when they were a few years younger now and and listen to the songs and it struck me during the first five seconds of that film and the first five seconds of the first song what happens is the very first thing that we hear isn't words it's basically a sound it's that whoa sound so you don't need to speak any particular language to make that sound you don't really need to be able to sing to make that chant really it's not in harmony so you don't need to process music at all it's just lots of voices on the recording singing the same note as if it's a football stadium or whatever so the first thing you hear in that song is just lots of people in unison singing a sound mm -hmm. basically and then the very next thing that you hear is a very definite rhythm of and that's it right and if you're familiar with that soundtrack that's not drums it's people stamping on the floor so again you don't need to be a drummer to do that you can just stamp on the floor and do that and then that kind of links itself deliberately to huge songs like we were rock you queen it's literally the same thing da, 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 you know it's the same thing of people just stamping on the floor so your brain if you've ever heard we were rock you which most of us have you watch the greatest showman and within five seconds you've linked it to a song that you've known for years mm. you you've linked it to not even needing to speak a language or play an instrument you can sing it and you can play it straight away and basically the whole song then progresses with one little simple thing after another and it kind of blends hip-hop and trap influences with pop and rock and gospel all in the same song and by the time you've built it on a foundation of very simple melody that pretty much anyone can sing very simple rhythm that you don't really even need to play an instrument to replicate and then you're pulling in influences which are going to appeal to lots of people it's sort of not surprising that it became the biggest selling album of the 21st century and a film which everybody loved because most people wouldn't realize why they liked it but there's hundreds of reasons why it appeals to you and the person next to you and the person next to them because it's all feed uh, in, in a good way it's feeding what everybody is already familiar with mm. in a nice tidy package of pop yeah and i think a lot of people would, would watch the film and think of it that one success and think oh the success of that film is because of the the themes in the film that we resonate and we like the kind of the progressive tones of it and you know the celebration of diversity and the, the honoring of people we love that but actually the reason it's so popular is the package it comes in yeah which is a package that bypasses the intellect yeah. and goes straight to the, the gut and the heart yeah and and moves you as a musical man yeah uh, as a creature why this is, works it becomes sticky and attractive it yeah. gets to your heart very quickly yeah and then you find yourself singing the songs and the content of the songs gets in and it gets into you and shapes the way that you think and changes the values that you hold. Yeah. Which again is the power of music to bypass the rationality yeah. and change the way that people think and see the world. Well, that's the thing you know, with that film. There was obviously in the film, it is a nice saccharine sugary package of niceness and doesn't deal with any of the darker side of Barnum's character and you, you know all the stuff that, wouldn't have made it a popular film. It just doesn't even deal with them at all. It just no. ignores them and turns it into this just inclusive thing that we can all buy into and makes us happy. Yeah. <laughs> Which, again, so you immediately you can jump to the responsibility of people in doing that. Yeah. But there are who write those songs and write those films. But uh, again, there are other songs as well. Once you start, once you point out that one and we will rock you, there are others you realise the reason these songs are so popular isn't actually because of the lyrical content so much as it is the, the rhythm and the beat and the, the, yeah. the sounds that it's inviting me to make so I can join in and feel like it's mine. Yeah. Um, what, but what is the interplay or the, you can't say percentage, but what, how much do lyrics matter in a song's <laughs> success or is it much more about these tricks? <laughs> well, it would did this lecture last week actually okay. at BIM and um, 
it is divisive, you know, when you say to a room of songwriting students, which is most important, melody or lyrics? It, it's immediately divisive for lots of reasons. Um, partly because the songwriting student's brain immediately goes down the road of melody equals pop. I don't want to just do corporate pop. I want to tell stories. I want to tell truth in my songs and so on. So there's this kind of divide or divisive thing with songwriting students that they tend to associate truth and art and pop and, you know, business, basically. Because a lot of, like you just said, pop songwriting these days, it's it's rhythm, rhythmic hooks, it's melodic hooks, it's, you know, how quickly can you get an earworm into someone that they don't forget, you know, nursery rhyme kind of uh, melody and rhythm. In terms of percentage, that's a really good question. Um, What's your personal opinion on how which matters more in a, a song? Okay, success? my personal opinion. Okay, so my personal opinion would be, as a as pop perfection, there is the Greatest Showman, and those kinds of massive, you know, songs that appeal to everybody on earth, living on a prayer. Everybody on earth has heard "Living on a Prayer." You know, and there's some songs which just everybody knows. By Madonna, yeah? Sorry? Living on a prayer by Madonna. Um, no, no, no. <laughs> Sorry, I didn't to give you that. Thanks. <laughs> Thank you. Um, <laughs> um, but, you know, there are songs that just we all know. Everybody on earth knows them. ABBA, lots of ABBA songs. We all know ABBA songs, whether we're, you know, eight years old, like my youngest daughter, or me or my mum. We know ABBA mm. because they're just brilliant pop songs um you throw me now with your madonna comment um so which is more personally more important yeah it's um... yeah so i think for those kinds of songs it's the perfect marriage of melody and lyric where anyone in the world can sing it and it means something to you you know when you're in a football stadium or wherever on the train listening to living on a prayer they're singing about you. It's your life they're singing about and the person next to you's life and my life and his life and her life. Mm -hmm. It's, you know, it's universally, yeah, that's my story. And I think the songs which really stand the test of time are the ones that you can sing them and it's your story as well that you can identify with. So I cast them on a hill, Ed Sheeran, a few years ago. Very popular because it was just evocative of a lot of people's childhoods. Yeah. He was like, oh, I remember being a teenager and doing this and doing that. I remember these memories I had of yeah. these great sunsets and these, you know, beautiful sights. Yeah, exactly. There's this, there's this phrase in songwriting of um, the more specific you are, the more universal the appeal, where people sort of mistakenly assume that if you leave it vague, everyone can make their own story from it. But actually, the opposite is true, where if, actually, if you give people names and dates and places and times and settings, mm. then that then the listener can just drop themselves into the story. It's like, oh, yeah, that sunset, that place where I was sitting then on mm. that seafront. You know, it's like, yeah, it might be a different seafront with different people on a different year, but it's still me and my friends and my seafront. So if you can get into people's lives you know make them buy into the story you're telling about them mm. in pop songwriting for mm. example then then that's a good thing and if you do that with melody and the story perfect yeah i guess the caveat to that would be or, or the actual answer to your question if it's not literally you know best case scenario marry melody and lyric and create something that everybody can just believe in <laughs> buy into if not that, in pop songwriting, because most most of the work that I do these days is much more pop focused, as opposed to congregational song focused. Um, still do some of that at church, but you know, um, work is much more pop focused. Melody is much more important, much more important. Melody and rhythm of vocal, rhythm of singing, is more important than lyric in most of. I think in most of pop music um, or lyrics, but then people are less focused on melody and it's, no, I want the story. I want to know, 
you know, I, I want to be told something important. Um, mm. And people do, you know, I said, I did this lecture a couple of weeks ago with a day of songwriters and, and they were split, you know, between actually I just want to write melody that people want to listen to versus no, I really want to just say something important and believe something that someone's telling me. So it is a challenge for a lot of people that they've got to have a truth that's worth telling. Yep. They've got to have a message they really want to put out there. And, um, and actually just making people feel better isn't probably a, a lasting enough truth or motive to you know to keep you going for a long period of time. No. You're not going to write a few good songs, yeah. but for, for, to write stuff that's going to keep going and whatever. But it strikes me there's a similar conversation I know as a, as a pastor, as a preacher, that I remember reading that your goal is to get to people's feet. You want them to move, to change, to do something different. Yeah. And the way you get there is... You want you want it to be informed by the head, but you you move the feet by going from the head to the heart to the feet. Yeah. And we've all been in sermons where someone gets to your heart and your heart moves your feet. You know, you're emotionally you're stirred, but it it runs out after a while because sooner or later your emotional emotions fade and you end up going, why am I walking? Why am I going anywhere? <laughs> yeah. But it's only when the the intellect the mind's been transformed and yeah. changed that you, your mind actually can keep going even after the emotions have faded. But you often get to it through the heart and it's that kind of that conversation isn't it yeah so you really want to change someone and move someone through your songs you can do it through the sugar yeah you know put, give them a sugar rush of melody but actually if you want it to last long it's got to combine both and if you yeah. want to bring about meaningful change in someone you've got to give them truth as well yeah you know the apostle paul's be transformed by the renewal of your mind yeah, um, yeah. what i find interesting is how you know how human this is this isn't because as Christians and as charismatic Christians, we we know the, the beautiful, sacred experiences of being in congregational worship times and experiencing the presence and power and beauty of God there. And it moves you. And it's, it's very impactful. But it's not reserved to just the... That's not just a uniquely Christian experience at a mm. Christian church service. Yeah. And often Christians get confused when they go to a football stadium or they go to a, co- a festival of just a regular band and they experience the same level of inspiration and movement. Yeah. Christians can be confused and think, oh, is that God? Was that not God? Is this just manipulation? Yeah. Is, am I just... How, how have you thought through that experience? Is that something you've grappled much with personally or helped Christians think through? Um, Good question. Thanks. Throw, throw a big one <laughs> thanks. There. Um, I remember a few years ago being at Anfield, watching Liverpool. Oh, I'm sorry. No, it's a good thing. Don't worry. It's a very good thing, Jez. Um, and I remember, I've only been to Anfield once to watch one game. And standing at Anfield was amazing. But there was obviously a moment before the match where every match the crowd sings You'll Never Walk Alone, the whole crowd. And I remember standing there singing You'll Never Walk Alone and listening to You'll Never Walk Alone being sung in that stadium in Liverpool and thinking... I don't know if I've ever heard anything like this ever. And it was a real challenge because, you know, I've I've traveled a lot playing at playing in the worship band at conferences and Stonely and New Day and, and around the world. Um and I remember standing at Anfield thinking, I'm not sure I've ever heard as passionate singing as right now with people singing about a football team. Which was a real challenge to me. And it might just be that I was caught up in that moment of thinking that, but I remember consciously thinking, this is a bit uncomfortable because maybe this is a bit we need to edit out, edit out, I don't know. (laughs) But um, yeah, it was a real challenge kind of going, man, I I don't often hear this kind of passion. You know, I haven't often heard this kind of passion in in the places I've been or the times I've sung in. Um, And there was no manipulation in that. It was just genuine, we are Liverpool. We are here in this stadium singing our songs to each other and for each other and for the team. Um, which also it doesn't answer your question at all. Um, no, you identify with the challenge. I think every Christian to some level experiences. I, 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 I would have a similar experience from going to the, a, a cinema to watch a film mm. and that moment of inspiration. I'm like, I can take the world, but it's not take the world for Jesus. It's just take the world, take the world yeah. because the story is inspired. Yeah. Stories, music, those sorts of experiences. And that's what fascinates me is that this is so human mm. and 
and for me it points to this the truth that all truth is god's truth that we live in an enchanted world and we mustn't create a secular sacred divide as though god is only in only in the christian songs yeah god is only in the sermons now i think i we could go further and, and recognize there's power in idolatry there's power in worshiping the true god because we're religious creatures in one sense we're born to worship mm. and so when you worship you experience the power of worship it, and the, the difference is often around the object of your worship and its yeah. impact on you and how life-giving or life-stealing that is i think that's that's how i've kind of processed it mm. but I'm, just, I'm really fascinated by that how did you then as a worship leader as a christian in congregational worship think what do I do about this? Why are they more passionate than Christians? Why, why, are they, why am I experiencing this here at a football stadium and not, and not in churches? Yeah. How did you process that after the event? Um, I think that's something that, I mean, this was a few years ago now, so I've, I've been processing it for, for a while. Um, and I keep coming back to how vitally important truth in songs is like the truth deep truth in songs like i was saying you know when i was a young christian my dad had just died i didn't really have many friends i'd lost most of my non-christian friends because i wasn't really hanging out with them anymore i didn't really have that many friends at church at that point and felt pretty alone um but it was the truth that was sinking into me that was life breathing you know because it's like well whether I knew it or not, I had truth just going into me and going into me all the time. And I think that, let's just look up this verse that's just, where's my phone? Just come to mind. Um, from Colossians. Let me just back check this is still recording. It is. We can edit this bit out. Um, Colossians 3. Uh, da, 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 da. Colossians 3, is it 16? Yeah, Colossians three sixteen. Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly, teaching and admonishing one another in all wisdom, singing psalms and hymns and spiritual songs. You know, the more, the more I live and the more I think about it and the more reflecting on things like being at Anfield and singing You'll Never Walk Alone with passionate, you know, zealous people, um, the more I I want, you, you know, the word of Christ to dwell in us richly in our songs, you know, so that actually the way it's explained there, you know, where it, it it's it's a teaching thing, you know, let it dwell in you rich, richly, teaching and admonishing one another in all wisdom, singing psalms and hymns and spiritual songs with thankfulness in your hearts to God. And whatever you do in word or deed, do everything in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father through him. You know, if our songs are built on, the word of god and we're able to teach ourselves and each other through that and admonish ourselves and each other through that and you know sing psalms and hymns and spiritual songs by having the word of god dwell in us that's going to bring life build life you know to where like you said just now where you have something going into your head into your heart to your feet that that I think is the way to do it, you know. Let the word of Christ dwell richly in you, and then head, heart, feet. I think where I find myself struggling sometimes to engage with songs, it it's almost where I'm thinking, I don't really feel this emotion that this song is telling me I should be feeling at the moment, and because I don't feel it, I can't. You know, I can't really engage with it in a way that if it was just telling me, here's God and here's the word of God being kind of, you know, infiltrating into me, it doesn't really matter how I feel or what's happening in my life at that point. It's just a truth which I can always use, always, you know, have built into me. So I do tend to struggle sometimes with songs where I'm just going... This is kind of true, but it's really just a song about how I feel. And I don't really want to sing a song about how I feel. I mean, even this Sunday coming, I don't know what date this is going to be going out, but, you know, I'm leading worship this Sunday at church for the first time in a while. I tend to just lead worship now as and when I'm needed to. And obviously sitting here right now with Russia invading uh, Ukraine yesterday, 
this Sunday at church, you know, it's really important that we worship God and we sing truth and it gets into us and dwells richly in us and we sing psalms and hymns and spiritual songs because we want to worship God this Sunday. And what I'm anxious not to do is just <laughs> use songs, particularly this week, you know, every week, but particularly this week where it's just, this is how I feel, this is how we feel, this is this thing that's happening that we need to kind of process and actually just to head into it going, actually, firstly, we need to process how awesome God is and how great God is. Mm. And, you know, obviously, you know, we're going to be praying for Ukraine and obviously like every, like everyone is, like every church is, but, you know, it's got to be built on we're going to worship God mm. and sing truth and have truth built into us. Yeah, it's, uh, it's just speaking, I'm just thinking of Jesus saying, in the world you'll have trouble, but take heart for I've overcome the world. What we're talking about when we're talking about worship songs, we're talking about how to take heart, mm. how to get something into our heart. Yeah. When we get something into our heart, Jesus says, by remembering, I've overcome the world. Yeah. And uh, and that, so I know the, the conversation, these conversations can quickly move to, so what are your favourite songs or worst songs? You know, these songs are bad, these songs are good when it comes to Christian worship. Mm. Um but I think first of all, it's just recognizing the power that songs have to teach, to equip, to refocus your mind. Yeah. Because it get because when you sing, you engage your emotional life, which then reorients the way that you're thinking about something because your emotions are engaged. And it's just being aware of the responsibility like, that this is a tool for discipleship. Yeah. Um, you said earlier that um, songwriters will think, oh, I just want to tell my truth. And first and foremost, as Christians, we've got to have a truth to tell. Yeah. And that truth in a society like ours, our truth is our personal story. But actually, as Christians, we've got something much more true than our personal story. Yeah. We've got the gospel story. Um, and so maybe this is just more of a general question then about not so much music, but just how do you then as a Christian or someone who trains worship leaders um, and di Christians generally, disciple, how do you encourage them to, to allow the word of Christ to dwell in them? What sort of things would you uh, suggest to people? In day-to-day -day life? Yeah. Um, I think vitally important, um, which is, I guess, going to sound like an obvious answer, but vitally important is reading the Bible and being alongside people that are reading the Bible and reading the Bible with each other. I remember hearing um, Chuck Swindle, I think it was, saying, you know, in one of his preachers, he said, do you want to know what God's saying to you today? Read the Bible. Do you want to know what God says to you about your life? Read the Bible. Do you want to know what God says to you about your job? Read the Bible. Do you want to know what God says to you about your kids and your family? Read the Bible. It's like, oh, yeah. And I think the more, it sounds like an obvious answer, but for me, the older I get and the more, I guess, life experience I get, the more I realise all the time actually getting into the Word of God and grappling with it and figuring it out and you know even a sort of throwaway thing that we're probably going to edit out talking about the beginning of time and stuff from earlier you know just working working it out working out what you know what, what how do i interpret genesis one and two what do i think about this and and really studying scripture for me that that would be if a 18 year old said to me i want to write songs i want to lead worship what should i do one of the very first things I'd say is study the Bible, grapple with it, get alongside people that can help you grapple with it, help you understand it, so that we don't end up with, you know, it's obviously been some fairly high profile songwriters recently that have kind of hung up their guitar straps and gone, I never really believed this in the first place. I'm off now. I knew how to write songs. I was taught how to write songs. I was taught how to tug at the heartstrings and write songs that said things to people of how they should feel and react and so on. But, you know, there's been some quite high profile people that are saying, I never really believed it myself. And I'm just, I'm done with it now. So, which is, you know, heartbreaking when that happens and heartbreaking when it happens to people or with people that you thought were writing songs for the church based on their own life and their own, you know, integrity. And it turned out that actually they were 
professional songwriters that knew how to write a worship song mm -hmm. that people would want to sing. So, so much more important to me that, and for myself, it's so more important for my own life to be real and reflect who I am in God mm. because of who he is and what Jesus has done and, and to actually understand those truths and, you know, really get to the bottom of books like Galatians, you know, and Romans and, mm. you know, to really, really figure it out and understand it and take it on board so that you can then write songs and lead worship and lead people, mm. you know, would be one of the only things I'd say, uh, <laughs> I think. And, yeah, and I think you know, a word to, to leaders as well is that I have seen it often. The people who are involved in the, the nuts and bolts of Christian services, let's say, whether it's people in production, people in the band, the meeting leaders, the preachers or whatever, when you've done it a long time, you recognise a lot of the mechanics involved. And sometimes when you, you, know, you see the mechanics, people can get quite disillusioned for want of a better word or just cynical towards the process because you realise there's so much about this that appears to me to be just merely human mm. as though that's that negates the truthfulness of what's going on or you know the Holy Spirit's doing this oh no I think psychologically this is happening mm. as though we need to create this split between again spiritual sacred yeah. uh, or secular and uh, and God and not God and I think we're the worst judges of our own success or what God's doing at the best of times anyway yeah but Again, how what would you say to people who have maybe been involved? Because when you're involved in production, you're putting in long hours to yeah. fine tune this instrument, and and you're sitting there going, "Oh, I know the congregation are responding like this, not because of God, they might think, but because of the the beats per minute in that song." Yeah. Uh, what would you say to people like that who had just been living in that headspace for so long, they've become a little bit cynical? Yeah, yeah, I yeah, <laughs> I, I remember it for myself. Um, so back when I was doing a lot of playing in worship bands at conferences and you know we I uh, played with um Paul Oakley who who wrote a lot of the New Frontiers song or, or you know was in New Frontiers wrote a lot of the songs we sing like Jesus Love of My Soul and Who Is There Like You and that kind of thing and I played in Paul's band for about five years and Paul and I were really good friends still are good friends I haven't seen him for a while but we're still good friends and Paul and I used to write songs together at that time and it was it it began very you know i was like a kid just it was just so exciting to be worshiping god and playing guitar and worshiping god and going on a plane and getting somewhere and off the other end and worshiping god when it began and without even really noticing when you've been doing that a long time and you know you, that goes from okay you get on a plane you get off the other end you play you get back on the plane, you get off the other end, you go to the hotel, you have a shower, you go, you play. And I remember there were times when it's really difficult because we'd be, you know, you'd start off this worship time, time of singing, with songs that were great and had really good truth in them and, you know, people were singing. And I remember there were times when I was standing there thinking, I just wish we could start with a different song because... I've played this song 500 times in the last two years and it was just, you know, autopilot. And it's really difficult because there's not much you can do about it. Um, and it, it's not so much cynical in terms of not believing it's real or not believing what's happening is real, but it, it's just this kind of autopilot thing where you just go, I can't engage with this in, at the moment because this is another conference with the same songs. I'm standing in the same place on a different stage, singing the same backing vocals to the same song while people are engaging with God. And those might make me sound terrible. <laughs> I don't know, but just on a purely human level, I remember standing there at times just thinking, I don't really know why I'm doing this at the moment because I do love God. But at the moment, I'd quite like to just go home to my family and my friends and go to church and go to a prayer meeting or, you know, do something other than mm. stand here on this stage with my guitar playing these songs. And I think that's the thing I don't miss most about doing that as a job because it was my living at the time and how I paid the bills and mortgage. Um, and I'm sure there are people that don't fall into that trap, I'm, I'm sure, but I know there are a lot that do because when you do the same thing 
all the time, all day, every day, in the same way, mm. there's sort of no way it can't become, you know, just part of, this is what I'm doing at eight o'clock tonight. I'm playing this song again. Yeah. Um, it's also part of the challenge that we're in a culture that places such a high value on personal authenticity, a personal authentic, emotional authenticity, whatever the phrase yeah. is, versus other cultures and other times that would have placed a bigger emphasis on the importance of duty mm. and honour rather than personal authenticity. And it's not to say that's doing something as a duty because it's a responsibility I'm holding and I might not be emotionally engaged, but that's not wrong. But we're so trained to think, oh no, it has to be yep. your you know, your sweet 16 heart song every, yeah. every time. Yeah. Otherwise it's not genuine. I know worship leaders, anyone who, who does ministry regularly, you think, sometimes I've just got to do it because I've got to do it. Like, people need me to do it and it's not actually, if, if it's about the word of God and the spirit of God, then it's not really about me and my heart all the time. Mm. And trying to help people navigate that. I, I just know when I'm, you know, for any Christian workers, I know when I first started working for a church in ministry, one of the hardest challenges is when Jesus goes from being your saviour to your colleague. <laughs> and then you have days off. You're like, that's my yeah. colleague. Like, I don't, I don't want to see my colleague on my day off. But actually, you're cultivating looking after your own heart before God mm. in and amongst all the nuts and bolts of your ministry. It's yeah. like, you know, some worship leaders I know are, who, who are in the charismatic worship scene are now in very different church streams, very different styles of worship because that's the charismatic, like, I say charismatic is not the right word, actually, contemporary music scene mm. that just became noisy to them and busy yeah. and 120 beats per minute all the time. Yeah. Actually, there's nothing wrong in the more reflective, silent kind of expressions of worship and trying to have a broader palette when it comes to our worship. Yeah. But so, so sorry, I interrupted, but so yeah, just general kind of comments then and help to people who are experience that similar kind of trap of being stuck and borderline cynical. Yeah. I mean, yeah, I I never got cynical, but it did just become, like you say, you know, it's what you do that day. It's what you do as a job. And I, I think for me, and probably I guess for a lot of people that do music, when my love of music, which was my hobby when I was a teenager, suddenly became my job. So I didn't have a hobby anymore because my hobby was my job so now suddenly it's oh I've got to do this thing today because it's my job now which then when you pull it into the equation oh and I love worshiping God and now that's part of my job as well you kind of there, there was a season where I, I did kind of go well my hobby is now my job my love of worshiping God in this context with these gifts is also now my job and if I don't have enough work I can't pay my mortgage very easily and when all that becomes just facts of life, it's pretty difficult. Mm. So I guess, I mean, my encouragement, I guess, would be for me, I don't know if this will encourage anyone, I couldn't do that again as a job. I wouldn't want to do that again as a job. If anyone said to me now, do you want to come and do this for the next two years, which is effectively the same thing, for me, it wouldn't be the right thing because I couldn't, you know, the thing I love these days, the thing I love about doing music. And and I guess the reason why I've, I've deliberately kept, you know, church and music separate to a certain extent these days is I really love music a lot, really enjoy it. And I'm happy not doing much of that in terms of, my living as Christian music. In fact, none of that these days is my living because it's my job and I like my job because it's music, which then doesn't mean I in any way get into any of the confusion or cynicism or anything mm. with Christian music as a, you know, a business because mm. I'm not involved in it. And I wouldn't want to be involved in it. Mm. Um, and the things I really enjoy now are, you know, obviously being an elder at church, becoming an elder very recently, about six weeks ago, obviously learning how to be an elder mm. of a church is much more life-giving to me personally um, and challenging in a good way to me personally. And, you know, I'd imagine probably if I was to say to you, Jez, you've been an elder for a decade now, do you ever get cynical Probably you do. I don't know. I'd, I'd imagine in 10 years' time, maybe I'll be sitting here going, well, actually, the really difficult thing about being an elder now is 
all this. Yeah. It, it, like you said, you know, well, Jesus I, becomes I, your colleague. I suppose what, yeah, what you're saying is there's this, um, with anything that we do, you need a grace from God. You know, you might use the word calling. We certainly need a grace from God to be able to do it. And if, if it's not life-giving, as you use your word, um, then it's not necessarily the thing you should be doing right now. Yeah. You actually need to co- look after, you know I mean, the, the prov- Proverbs, guard your heart because <laughs> mm. it's the wellspring of life. And if you're stuck in something that is producing cynicism or just robbing you of joy, stop it right now because yeah. your joy is really important and you find your joy in Christ yeah. and doing what Jesus has called you to do. Um, so I think, yeah, it's very helpful uh, advice from you. Um, Maybe not the most positive advice We don't catch you the positive. <laughs> no, no, nobody does. <laughs> <laughs> You can edit this bit out as well if you want. So, you know, you talk about the importance of truth in songs. And I was only talking with someone recently that when we talk about truth, what I think often we're, we're meaning is in the scriptures, I was just reflecting, reading something recently in the scriptures, the, the things that most regularly produce the kind of healthy fear of God that is life giving and wisdom are the, seeing the wisdom of God in the cross or seeing the wisdom of God in creation. You know, and then we all think of songs where we sing about creation. <laughs> yeah. And we don't actually have enough of them. Perhaps, perhaps that's, yeah. that's a challenge. You know, I remember I, I listened recently to something that, particularly in this age where we're very concerned with, you know, climate and stewarding the planet, especially to celebrate God in creation and mm. God's gift of creation is useful. But the comment is really just about, um, we talk about truth and writing songs and choosing songs for church is perhaps trying to help people to see what fuels the heart most isn't the melody and like that might get the feet going mm. it's actually seeing the wisdom of god in the cross so the gospel in the songs yeah um is that something you'd agree with yes <laughs> definitely <laughs> <a> rubbish <laughs> absolutely <laughs> definitely yes i would <laughs> like, here's a point do you agree with it good right next question yes, yes i do <laughs> no i do definitely it, as I said, you know, even this this Sunday, where obviously everybody is going to be thinking Russia, Ukraine, and so on. The songs that we're doing this Sunday, it you know, it leads us to the cross, mm. and you know, it should. I understand all this stuff about music theory. Does it make you quite suspicious of emotion and suspicious of songs that just get you tapping your feet, and you kind of monitor the sort of songs you're seeing, your kids listen to? Are you, are you not? Does it, does it make you just kind of suspicious of the world and its influences? <laughs> <laughs> when you see the tools and the tricks of the, the trades that motivate human behaviour. It doesn't. Um, I think I think because, you know, thinking back to, you know, 50 years ago when Motown was a hit factory, you know, it was the big office block with people writing songs all day and handing them to the right person to go and record and go and sing. And I think what you know, we would sort of say today is oh that was such a amazing vintage pure time of pop unlike now when it's all manufactured you go actually Motown was manufactured probably more than pop is today we just don't really associate it with manufactured pop we associate it with artistry so it it doesn't worry me at all um, that songs are manufactured Partly because, kind of going back to what we started with, if there are things that just work because they work, because people identify with them and it makes us not have an emotion created for us that someone's saying, I'm going to manipulate this thing out of you. But if actually that thing actually helps you to engage in worshipping God, well, that's not a bad thing. And if that tempo works because it works, because it helps people in a non-manipulative way, that's a good thing. So I think in, in some ways, I don't see it as a negative because I can see it as a positive of actually using it well, mm-hmm. like anything. Um, having said that, obviously there are, like for all of us, there's songs which you hear or, you know, Whatever it is, things you watch, where you just kind of go, it just looks like it's being manufactured, and it shouldn't be. 
It should it's not be. even just the manufacturing of it, it's the manipulating of yeah. the people. There's a propaganda yeah. approach. You know, we're we're living in a society that is using propaganda a lot to change values. Yeah. Um, but it, but it's even recognizing. I think I remember hearing somewhere that radio, some Radiohead songs have been banned from being played on the radio because it produced suicidal tendencies or depressive tendencies that people because just the power of music to do. Yeah. That. So there must. It might sometimes make you just more wary and nervous of what you let your kids listen to, does it, as a parent? I don't know. Or even just as a church leader, like, let's just let's not sing this song because it's good, like clappy and happy yeah. the melody. Let's be very careful because this yeah. could shape the way that we see ourselves and God. Yeah, 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 that's true. I think it, it I guess I'd go even further than songs, you know, these days, like my kids are 13, 11 and 8. And even just, trying to regulate what they're watching on YouTube or what they're watching on, you know, TV or whatever is, which I guess if I was that age, it would have been songs. It would have been records that I was listening to or the radio I was listening to when I was their age. But now I almost don't notice some of the things my kids are watching because it isn't music. It's just people on YouTube talking. And actually I looked over my youngest daughter's, she's eight now, her shoulder the other day when she was just watching something on her iPad, which which was a kid's thing. I forget what the title of it was, but it was a kid's thing. I just noticed the title and went, what are you watching that for? And she she didn't seem to realise, I, I can't remember what it is, but even by the title of it, it, it was just like, mm-hmm. I don't think I want to watch in that. And it was just something that she didn't even really know she was watching. I missed it because it was just sort of white noise in the background of something she was watching on an iPad, which wasn't songs, which I think are more obvious when you're listening to lyrics. It's like, oh, hang on a minute. I don't want you to listen to that. Mm. But there's even more subtle, I think, Yeah, without getting things. into the, you know, rock and rolls from the devil kind of, which people are aware that Christians have always been very suspicious and nervous of new technologies or of new things that are worldly. And it's healthy caution there. But it's understanding what we're really cautious about is sometimes the message behind it and just them being mindful of the, the tricks that can be used to manipulate someone to believe yeah. the message by bypassing the head to get to the heart and then by that changing the way that people live mm. in a way that isn't um, gospel-centred. Yeah. Um, Martin, we're out of time, but before we well, go, we are, is there um, anything else in your mind or heart that you'd like to just share as we close? <laughs> my mind or my heart? Yeah. Um, oh, we'll cut that. Yeah. <laughs> we, we, no, we'll cut that. Um I, yeah, I guess sort of, like I've said a couple of times, probably already, the older I get, the more experienced I get, or the more experience I have, rather, um, the more I keep being driven and making sure I drive myself to the Word of God as my primary, you know, where am I going to, where am I going to look? I'm going to look into the Bible to figure life out. And I probably, if I'd said to my younger self that 25 years ago, I'd have saved myself some trouble <laughs> along the way if I'd done it, immersed myself in it earlier than I did. Mm. So I've said that a couple of times, but I stand by it at the <laughs> end as well. <laughs> but actually, I, I meant to say last, when you, when you brought that point up earlier about the importance of the truth, I think it's important as well that people hear that Christianity isn't, isn't just for literate people. Um, because actually the way people learn about the song, learn about the world, is through truth. Mm. And the responsibility for literate types, people who like reading the truth, who then communicate that to others, disciple others, using songs that do this. I mean, historically, that's how Christians have been trained in discipleship, like you said, through memorization, through songs. Yeah. And it's important that we then, those who have the, you might say, the privilege of literacy, who like reading and engaging with words and ideas, have the responsibility to make sure that what we're communicating to others is from the pure source of truth. Yeah. Rather than putting that burden on everyone. You must, you must, be, you must love reading. But helping people engage with the Bible through audio, through songs, is, uh, is really key. Um, I should have linked it to music, shouldn't I? <laughs> absolutely. That's what I was doing as we closed. <laughs> Thanks, yes. <laughs>
Thank you so much for your time, Martin, and for being with us. It's a pleasure. Your, your wisdom, no doubt, we'll have to record more conversations in the future. And if people do have any questions about songwriting, please direct them to Martin at the British and Irish Modern <laughs> Music Institute. <laughs> Bim, for short. Thanks for being with us, Martin. Thanks, Jess. Ah, <laughs> oh, wonderful.